Good afternoon, and welcome to Fed Now and the Movement of Money. This is an exciting day. We're getting a lot of news coverage about Fed Now launching today. What should banks know about leveraging this instant payments infrastructure? How will it affect customer behavior? And what technology or talent considerations should be addressed? Thank you for joining us. I'm Naomi Snyder, Editor-in-Chief at Bank Director. This webinar is brought to you by both Bank Director and Finsley. For those of you who don't know us yet, Bank Director has been a financial resource for the financial community since 1991, focusing on strategic issues fundamental to the bank's CEO, senior leadership team, chairman, and independent directors. Finsley enables banks to effortlessly provide end-to-end -end money movement. Finsley empowers banks to collaborate with ecosystem partners and corporate clients, and it offers unified API to all payment networks and unveiled the industry's first API for accessing FedNow. Before we get started, let me just share a few housekeeping items. Don't worry, we can't hear you. You have joined this webinar in listen-only mode. We recommend that you click on the sidebar, the slide bar at the bottom of the screen to put the presenters into full screen mode. If you have questions for our speaker, please note them by clicking the Q&A button found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can do this at any time during the presentation. Once the presenter has finished his talking points, we'll have a Q&A period where those questions will be addressed. There is no need to take detailed notes. The presentation will be shared with all attendees within 24 hours via email. It will also be available on bankdirector.com. If you have any technical issues, you may also note those using the moderator chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll do our best to take care of it. Finally, the opinions expressed in this webinar are those of the individual speaker only and do not necessarily re reflect bank directors' views. And now let me introduce uh, our speaker today. Bhushan Rangachari founded Finsley in 2012. Bhushan has guided Finsley in delivering award-winning payment and trading solutions. Previously, Bhushan served in a leadership position at Wells Fargo, where he managed international banking, overseeing sales, trading, and operational solutions. Recently, Bhushan was elected to represent the technology provider segment on the board of directors of the Faster Payments Council, where he, has at, where he advocates for the implementation of secure and faster payment capabilities in the United States. His educational background includes an engineering degree in computer science, as well as degrees in machine learning from Stanford University and accounting from Wharton University. With that housekeeping out of the way, Let's get started with the webinar. Bhushan, hello. Hello, uh, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very excited, and thanks for inviting us, and really looking forward to this conversation. Yes, and just so that our audience knows, that's the background behind you of the history of the company, right? So at, at first I was thinking it was the history of Fed Now. <laughs> but, um, let's get started with the, the basics uh, before we get into a technical discussion. Then, of course, the audience will also have a chance to ask some questions. Can you just start with what is Fed now and how is it different from what has come before? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, you know, Fed now is the very modern, latest real time payment network launched and run by Federal Reserve Bank. What has happened in the past is, you know, Federal Reserve had earlier launched ACH payments, which is mostly file-based. You know, you send your file with thousands and thousands of payments, and then you get your response back in the thousands, you know, in another file. This kind of very old batch-oriented process, you know, it worked at the time. It was revolutionary, like 40, 50 years ago. Um, and then later they launched wires to, to take care of the large value payments. But with the evolution of the technology and the needs, real-time payments became so important. Like, you know, real-time payments is, is, has been happening all over the world. 
And you know, US has been a little bit behind in terms of launching these products, but you know, it's kind of a good catch up uh, from this side. But there is a lot of excitement um, in what is happening in Fed now. There is a totally new payment rail um, run by Federal Reserve, but you know, there is also another payment rail um, which is run by Clearinghouse that is called RTP, Real Time Payment Network. So we have two versions of Real Time Payment running and uh, run by the innovators. Yeah, yeah. And I just have been hearing a lot of um, a lot of questions about this, a lot of interest in this. I want to ask you why you think this is getting quite the interest that it it has. I'm hearing things like, well, the federal government's going to they're going to be the you know social security payments and everything is going to be on Fed now. That's why we need to be there because all these government payments are going to be there. Yeah. So you know the the main the, the, there's a lot of excitement, right? Because um, US, US dollar is the world currency, right? It has been used um, by several nations and there's a lot of interest. They know they all, everybody wants to move money. And we are seeing quite a good of, amount of interest from a lot of players uh, who wants to access Fed now. Um, if you look at in the history, right? This is the first, late, first payment trial that has been launched after several decades. So no modernization has happened in the past in the in this space in the payment space like you know even though we have another payment rail launched by clearing house you know from the federal reserve perspective this is the new payment rail launched and it's real time right um and uh, the reason there is so much of excitement is because if you look at other part of the world you know india Bra brazil and other countries they have launched real time payments like more than 15 20 years ago and uh, if you take just India, where I am right now, like came here to visit our teams, you know, that's our <laughs> Finsley history. Um, you know, 65% of the payments today in, in India is all happening through real time UPA payments. And in another two years, it's expected to reach more than 90%, right? Um, so 45% of the world payments are happening in India. So basically, that means you know, I, 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 I was so surprised with the amount of uh, real-time payments that's happening here. Even a street vendor has a QR payment and you can make payments through, um, through the UPI uh, system. And that has happened, you know, in the very recently in the last, you know, seven years or so, right? So this is the world's fifth economy. So now what, now think about the impact it's going to have in the world's number one economy. Yes, right? So that's where there's so much of excitement because, you know, money movement is everything. Like, you know, every transaction, every commerce or, you know, any exchange needs a money transfer and people want it to be real time. And that's why, you know, there's so much of interest because it's a totally new technology and uh, and modern and, and it's run by Federal Reserve. So there is so much of things going on and a lot of interest and very, very it's a great time to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So. So how long does it take to launch? Let's get into some of the practical aspects of this. Uh, the Fed announced um, today who was on the system. They've listed a number of institutions, banks, um, credit unions, right, that are already there, already set up. Um, the cores are on there, various other fintechs. Yeah. So. You know, the federal, there are a couple of, there are various parts involved in launching Fed now, right? So if, if you take from bank's perspective or credit union perspective, they need few things set up um, in order to launch. One is they need connectivity with, with Federal Reserve. So that's something, you know, um, we are one of the providers then we offer that real time connectivity readily available. And then one, so with Winsley, like what we do is we can launch a payment Fed now access for a bank or credit union in less than seven minutes. So we have a very automated process that can bring a new system for, for these players and they have immediate access to FedNow. They can send and receive payments, right? But what needs to happen after that is banks also needs to connect to the core platform. Like the core platform is where the customers hold their account. So you need to debit or credit based on the direction of the payment. And that core connection needs to happen. In addition to that, the banks needs to connect with the fraud, AML, OFAC, and other systems. Though so that's that's you know that takes about you know three four months, and you know but if you already have connections with such providers, it can be much faster, maybe one or two months. All you need to do is just connect to those players and then you know test and go live. So you know depending on the bank, um, their ecosystem, 
it may take anywhere from two to six months, right? Um, that's that's the time you, you should expect uh, the Fed now to be launched. Um, and then, you know, but, but what we do is from our side, like, you know, we make that infrastructure that is readily available, right? Because um, the connection itself would take about six months. And we have all the things already done and ready for the banks to uh, go. Okay. So six months or so. Um, and what are the challenges to launching FedNow? Because it's it's 24-7, right? It's quite a bit different from the batch systems that we've had in the past. Yeah. So, you know, we have been working with several financial institutions. And, uh, you know, the one of the first... You know, there are several challenges, right? The very very first challenge is the payment network is 24 by 7, right? But the core is not 24 by 7. So a lot of the cores that has been built, you know, in the last 30, 40 years, and they have never evolved over a period of time. And we find challenges, hey, you know, there is payment coming in, but the core is down because it is running end of day process. So, you know, you need to create workarounds to deal with that limitation. Unless you have your core, that can also um, run and support 24 by 7 posting and processing. So that is that is one of the very first limitation. And uh, and then you have to respond back to Fed within a few, you know, a couple of seconds, right? The total time that you can, that is given now is about 10, uh, 10 seconds. So, you know, within that time, you need to validate if the account is good and you need to do some other fraud check and all that stuff and then respond back within that limited time. So, you know, from our side, we just take very microseconds, right? Just, you know, because our system is very highly uh, advanced in technology. So we do that, but a lot of time we, we get stuck because the response from core takes time. Like, you know, so we work with uh, uh, some of the providers to explain, hey, what can be done to speed up that response so that, you know, we can respond back uh, to the bank and uh, to Fed within those seconds, right? Right, right. And then... Uh, yeah. But the bank is not a 24-hour operation, right? So how do you see banks and credit unions approaching that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's a big challenge. You know, um, we we deal with that question a lot of time. Um, so, you know, 24 by 7 is, you know, you need, to, you need to have control. You need to have various risk controls. You know, there are certain things that you can automate. There are certain, you know, you have to have some, like, there is a payment coming in. And you have OFAC hit or you have a fraud risk, then what do you do? So you have to make those decisions. So one of the things that bank has to adjust to this payment network is to plan for 24 by 7 operations support. Um, you know, that's that's the way the world is going, right? You know, you need to be able to support or you need to have modern systems that can smartly make some decisions and or, you know, or what you'll end up doing is you'll end up not processing that one, but that's that will put you out of compliance because you cannot go down. So one of the rule in FedNav is, you know, you cannot go down for any reason because, you know, they expect you to be 24 by 7. So the options in front of the banks is to plan for support. You know, they are going to have three shifts and it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's not a big deal for banks of big size and uh, medium size, but it's a big deal for smaller community banks. And I think, you know, there are also other options, right? Um, you know, there are outsource options where they can outsource that. Um, those decisioning to to your player, you know, obviously with a lot of risk and control, you know, that is one of the option or they have to um, plan and plan that support in-house. Mm -hmm. And then the other aspect of this is, is, um, is the, is the demand side, you know, where, you know, where are you seeing the demand for Fed now? So, like, you know, if you take any payments, right? You know there is there is a lot of there are two types two set two set of uh, customers. One is consumers and then corporate customers, right? Businesses and individuals. Um, you know you cannot make money in any of those. You know any of anything that you are offering to individuals, right? Because you know Venmo is free. Um, you know Zelle and other all every every other solution is free in terms of the money transfer. And uh, you know that's not a you know that's not a money you know revenue center for the banks, but it's a deposit center. Right? It gives them access to low cost deposit. So you know the banks take that chance. Oh, okay, you know I'm going to 
you know, offer the services for free for consumers, but the way they make money is on the corporate side, right? The, today, on the corporate side, they are offering ACH payments and wire payments. Now they are going to give another option. Hey, that's, you know, that's batch and wire is, you know, it's still not instant, you know, it's, it's kind of almost, you know, uh, faster, it's very fast than ACH payments, but it's not instant payment. So when you offer the real-time instant payments, you know, it's a good opportunity, good option for the corporate to send money. So the banks should look for enabling uh, that send options, right? But a lot of other areas where banks will start, um, you know, making revenue is offering this Fed now to other providers, right? So we we have so many uh, opportunities out there. Like there are, you know, we just we know about a law firm which wants to send a request for pay, right? Now there are two things, you know, two flavors in Fed now, right? To to kind of a little bit go deep into what exactly is Fed now. Fed now, with using Fed now, you can send money that is not reversible, right? It's it's final. And whatever you send, it's final. If you send it by mistake, you can ask the other party to return the funds, but it's up to that other in individual to return the funds or not. It's just like as if I'm giving you hundred dollars, you know, you have the hundred dollars done. And and you know, if I want it back, I have to ask you, and it's up to you to return it to me or not, right? So this is kind of very practical way of uh, uh, exchanging money. Uh, the other feature Fed now offers is request for pay. I can ask you, hey, here is the bill. Can you make this payment? And uh, that is another feature uh, Fed now offers, right? So both these features are very important in commerce, right? You know, you have a builder, you know, utility bill. I can send that request for pay to your bank account. You can see that one, and then you can approve that bill and send to that one. And mm -hmm. I can also request, hey, you know, here is this bill, and you know. Um, that, you know, let's say a law firm, right? Law firm, you know, when, when there are two options, either you can pay by ACH, which is going to take two, three days, or you can pay by, you know, cards. Now, cards has a higher, um, you know, interchange fees, you know, 2%, 3%, and sometimes, you know, more than that. And that's a cost observed and you know, taken by the uh, merchants or the businesses. But mm -hmm. when they offer that instant payment, through Fed now, you know, I'm going to send you a link. Hey, here's the link I want you to pay. You know, here's the request for pay. Click that link to make that payment. Then that's going to be instantaneous and it's going to be reduce the cost for this law firms, right? This is this is just one example. Mm -hmm. But as I said, you know, uh, real-time payments will transform the way the merchant payments are processed today. So today, most of the payments are, you know, card-based. Um, you, know, you know, there are other options like, you know, other real-time options like Venmo and Zelle. But when it comes to the Fed now, it is a very low cost transaction. And uh, I expect merchants start to offer QR based payments and I can make payments directly from bank account to this merchant. Right, right. And right. Yeah, so, and, but the, the problem is, is how do the banks and the credit unions, you know, make money from this and justify, you know, the cost of the system? Yeah, right? as, as I said, I think very true, right? As I said, you know, the revenue opportunities for them is going to come from corporates, businesses, and merchants, right? Um, you know, are those options available today? Yes, if you offer APIs. You know, for example, um, you know, we, we, we enable RTP and FedNow for a bank. And, uh, you know, we were waiting to test a transaction after we went live. But even before we send a test transaction, we started receiving payments from a, from a fintech because it's a, you know, it, it's a it's a player where you know somebody's withdrawing funds, and the option given to them is, hey, this bank is in the real time payment network. Do you want me to deliver payments in real time? And the user said yes, and then their platform delivered payment in real time, you know, just within few minutes after we went live. Right? That's amazing because, you know, uh, the uh, whichever bank is active or open in this real-time network and it is visible to all the participants and as soon as this bank is available then started receiving real-time payments right so this is just a use case where hey i'm withdrawing funds and I, I can be given two options one is send the funds through ach it's going to take two days or you know push the push yeah. to card and it's going to be some higher fees and then give send them, the payment to yeah. Fed now give them so, the option yeah so you know the only thing is 
the, the, way, the way banks make money is to enable these use cases, right? If, you know, just connecting to the network and sending and receiving is not going to allow them to make money. They have to offer these services to their business customers, to their corporate customers and merchants, and that is going to evolve, right? It's, we have just built the foundation now. You know, the Fed now just went live today, right? From here, it is going to be, you can start seeing a lot of use cases evolving from here, and that's where banks will start making money, not just from the direct customers and also offering, you know, additional add-on services like APIs and a you know, request for pay and push to pay, you know, uh, uh, push payments. Okay. And to clarify, it's on the bank or the credit union to actually launch these products that are going to be specific use cases, like for their merchants. It's not something that FedNow is giving. You know, how how do you implement these various products for your customers? Yeah. So, you know, th th I think that's that's a great question, right? Um, you know, as a bank, hey, how am I going to enable? You know, I'm just, you know, earlier, everything was happening within the banking system. Now, you know, you're talking about enabling merchants, you know, I'm not, I'm not that network, like, you know, that I'm not a Visa or MasterCard network, you know, which, which was doing all these things. But now bank is in the mix of all these transactions. I think, you know, that's where partnership, there are a lot of players, you know, we enable, we provide a lot of use cases, you know, we provide user experiences that can be added uh, by the bank. You know, they already have a business banking platform or consumer banking platform, so they can add on these experiences where, hey, this is the payment I want to send. Here is the bill I want to send. You know, here is the bill I want to get paid. So, and there are, you know, like that, there are other players who use these APIs and to enable those experiences, right? So, what what you could expect down the line is this ecosystem players, like you know, there are the players who wants to enable merchant services. Right? They will be using Fed now. Hey, here is my here is my platform. You know. And this is what you can use. And you can use digital wallets that will be um, enabling and set to send and receive Fed now payments. So again, as I said, you know, the where we are is we are in the stage, you know, we are just step, we are in the first stage, in the very first step of this Fed now evolution, right? We just launched. So what you can expect in the next one or two years is you can see a lot of fintech players and a lot of other ecosystem players coming up with solutions that can be delivered by the bank or through the bank or directly to other players, right? Because at the end, you know, FedNow is a, is a you know, very widely, broadly accessed payment network. And you can expect that to be easily available because, you know, we, we are the one of the first to deliver FedNow through the API. And we have so many players already testing our API, which means that these players, they can embed Fed now in their platform. You know, they can send payments through our API. All they need is, you know, your bank sponsor who can support those Fed now payments to send and receive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can request payments through the uh, through this API. Hey, give me payments, and here is the, my payment request. So, uh, you know, you cannot just think in the traditional way. Hey, here is how my previous payments worked, and I want to continue the same process. I don't think. That model would, would work, uh, and banks have to think more than just the traditional payment networks. Because in the previous method, you know, you go to the online bank, online banking, you send the payment. That could be one of the option, but that 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 should not be the only option. If the banks are very serious about making money through FedNow, they have to start thinking about offering the other add-on services that is going to run on FedNow. Mm -hmm. Like the ones that you've been mentioning. That's correct. You know, say, yeah. you know, if you look at, if you, you know, let's say, let's give, let's take an example, right? You are filing an insurance claim, right? You are filing an insurance claim and then say, hey, you know, there's somebody comes and looks at your house and they climb and then say, hey, you know, this insurance is approved, right? As soon as they say approve, what happens is the approve action goes to the insurance system and the insurance system say, hey, you know, this is the insurance is approved and what's the bank account of this individual? And I can receive the payment same day, you know, instantly, right? That that is not existing today. You know, that that may take, you know, today it may take five days to receive a check or get deposited in, you know, uh, after several days. So this is a totally new use case. 
what what should what will happen from this point is once we start giving this kind of experiences to the customers customers will start expecting you know real time payments right you know i have, i came to india like 3 years ago you know the number of upi payments the qr payments here is not you know it's not as much as what it is today you know if you go back 5 6 7 years ago very few vendors were using qr payments right so it's a it's a kind of a exponential uh, effect and you will start seeing you know once you start introducing this to some places oh this is so good so important so beneficial and that you will see that replicated in other places right but but the most important thing is you know the bank should be ready to start offering this fed now payments mm mm-hmm. yeah cuz their competitors are going to oh yeah you know like uh, you know think about this one instant payroll right how how often you want to get paid in uber you know if you are if you are a uber driver they get paid same day you know at the end of the day they get paid and how about you know now that's the experience i'm i'm having right now if i go and work in a restaurant and i want to get paid i want to get the tips paid same day you know can that system support it so the future is all about interconnected systems right interconnected economy so you can have a restaurant system capture how many hours you worked and how much tips you have earned and as soon as the manager submits that request or approves it i will receive that payment instantly because now my bank is enabled for fed now so if my bank is not enabled then you know my other friend she is receiving real time payments instantly and i am not receiving it because i am not connected to fed now then you know i am not going to go and ask the bank hey you know why are you not offering fed now what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask my friend hey who do you bank with and then just change my relationship to that bank because my funds are available instantly in real time right so it's kind of you know you need to offer fed now as a matter of customer retention and customer satisfaction otherwise you risk losing them mhm and then in terms of the i heard one core processor is starting out by facil- by facilitating the receipt of money but not the sending of money what's kind of the argument for and against that of of that approach yeah you know there are so receiving the money is the most easiest part right you know all you're doing is you know i'm i'm going to give the funds and deposit um in the system right but that's not where you will make money so when you're receiving funds you know you cannot charge the customer like say you know it's, it's just like it's just going to come and you you will not make any kind of revenue in just receipt only uh, transactions but you will make money when you start enabling send because hey i'm i'm enabling you to send real time payments instant instant payments and you have the benefit and your beneficiary is going to have that benefits and i'm going to charge you x dollars right it could be whatever fee they want to charge 10 dollars 15 dollars or whatever uh, the bank wants to charge and that's where they start making money right so if the bank is very serious about making uh, you know generating revenue from offering the service they have to they must think about sending payments and also enabling request for pay request for pay is the next big big thing and which will enable seamless you know billing and seamless payments and uh, more efficient reconciliation mhm yeah so both of them is you think both are important um tell and talk and speaking of core processors tell me about the clarify the different ways of deployment so you can use your core processor you can use a third party uh can you explain that uh, such as thinsley yeah sure i think you know there are multiple core providers right now core providers and there are other third party providers and you know you can go to fed now site and there are you know all the players who have been who have participated and we are one of the first to enable fed now payments you know so we are very proud of that at the same time you know it's you know it's uh, there are we you know all these players have a role to play the the biggest benefit that you know we bring in you know in, in when we are offering this payments is is to allow the banks to think fresh okay what i mean by that is if you look at the way the payments have evolved you first had ach payments and then banks launched ach system and then they launched they had an ach team and they threw some ach experience to their customers right 
So, you know, ACH was meant pri primarily for business, you know, businesses to send a payment file and then the banks will process them. So the banks were running, a, you know, a vertical ACH team and ACH processing. And then later a wire came and then banks purchased, licensed another wire system and they, you know, created a wire team and then they also gave their wire experience to their customers. And then, you know, you, banks also have FX, foreign international payments and international team, international experience. Now you add RTP and FedNow, you know, you're, you're just creating, you know, different, different verticals of payment teams and payment systems. But if you look at what the customers want, they just care about money movement. They really don't care about these many experiences. But today right. you are giving that many experiences. Hey, if you want to do ACH, go here. If you want to do wires, go here. Now I'm going to give you a different experience for RTP and Fed now. You know, that's that's not what the customers are looking for. And also as a bank, you are dealing with so many systems, so many teams, and it's not the best way to process payments. So what what we did was we we treated payment as a payment. You know, money movement is a one should be in one system. So we give one system and we give that one user experience and one API. And banks needs to have only one team, one payment team that can run. So, you know, getting rid of or replacing AC system or wire system, it's a long process, right? We say that's totally fine. At least banks who are all launching Finsley, it's like they have a long-term strategy because they just don't want to continue the path they have, they have traveled so far. Mm -hmm. And they want to be in a place that is feature-proof. Hey, this is where we want to be five years, 10 years down the line. And Finfly is the only solution that offers all these things in a single system. We offer settlement and clearing and all the way starting from initiation to the settlement and clearing. So we have a parallel payment core that does ACH wires, RTP and Fed now. Mm -hmm. So when banks want to launch a new payment rail, so they have to think about, hey, in RTP and Fed now, here is this, what this so we want to launch, but eventually we want to bring ACH and wires and international everything in a single system. You know, that's where we, we make a big difference than that's, other providers. Yeah. We're getting, Lushan, we're getting so many questions from the audience. I want to make sure we get um, their questions answered too. So even though I have lots of questions I want to ask about fraud and scams, I wanted to see if we could also just start with some of these questions and make sure the audience gets their questions answered. So the first yeah. one was, um, how do you balance the risk versus enhanced payment features? that benefit the customers with limited, and I think they were saying limited benefits for the FI, for the financial institutions. So yeah. balance risk versus, yeah. This, this That's stuff. a great question. Like no risk, you know, there is a saying that says, faster payment meets faster risk, right? Um, you know, you have very less time to act on frauds. So, you know, you need to have a better risk control fraud management system. So, um, you know, that's that's one of the things that banks should consider when they enable sending the payments, right? You know, uh, most of the systems, a lot of you know modern systems, they offer a lot of risk controls built within. So, to start with, you know, you need to you need to have different controls. Say, you know, this type of customers, and for this customer, I'm going to have only this much limit. You know, how much payments they can make? What is the payment velocity that I want all over per customer, right? Um, and then what is the total size of the transaction and you know, how much per transaction limit that you want to control, how much per day you want to control. And then you can also control the velocity of the payments per account. And then those things, those things are important. And then, you know, in addition to that, you need to have a fraud system. And there is also a lot of, you know, new fraud consortiums coming up where the banks share that information and enable the you know, the other financial institutions know aware of the, some of these rates, uh, the faster payments um, offer, right? You know, in terms of what it, what kind of benefits it creates uh, to financial institutions, and as I said, it's more of, you know, customer retention, right? You know, you need to offer the services. If you don't offer and the, your customer needs it, and if you're not offering it, most chances are they are going to find some other player who's offering that one. So, you know, the ramp up time to have see more revenue is going to be slow. But the thing is, the good news is that it's going to happen, right? You just, you know, do you want to be ahead of the game or you want to be, you know, capturing those opportunities or 
you risk losing those customers. So it's kind of, you know, you need to have, it's kind of chicken egg, right? You, you cannot, you know, the banks wants to see some potential opportunities before they're launching it, but you're not going to see the opportunities without launching it. So, um, so I think banks can start small. So that's why, you know, we, we created structure because we want to make sure banks are able to first see the potential value. So you can start small and then you, as you, as the volume grows, you can see, okay, Hey, this makes sense. You know, yeah. at the end what matters is how much you pay per transaction. Yeah. And, and speaking of the fraud, so there are things or scams potentially you can do to address that. So, you know, one of the drawbacks I think of the Fed now system is that, um, is is you can't control what the other banks are doing in terms of making sure that they're not fraudsters on on their end of the system you know and that yeah. your customers end up sending money to scammers so you can't control that ecosystem uh, but there are tools like you said velocity you can actually slow down you're saying some of the payments um uh and the limits so you can I think the maximum is half a half a million dollar transaction, but of course every bank gets to set that number themselves. Is that right? Yeah, you know the Fed now allows up to five. You know they they right now they are allowing only hundred thousand. They are eventually they will increase five hundred five hundred thousand limits, and that's the Fed now limit, right? But as a financial institution, I can set how much limit I want to give to Naomi, right? I want how much limit I want to give to Bushan, how much limit. I want to give this corporation. So that is controlled by the, by the financial institution, right? So when it comes to the fraud, the, what has happened, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's not the right way that we handle fraud in the past. Earlier, every financial institution, they know only their transaction. They didn't have, they did not have any visibility outside of what is happening in their bank, as you said, right? And, uh, you know, if some fraud is happening in another bank, they were not sharing any of those informations with, between them. And every bank has to replicate the same complex fraud processing in each and every bank. And the best way to do that is, you know, um, you know Fed now itself, it's creating some kind of rules to, to create that one. So they have a, some fraud mechanism that is, that is planned and that is, you know, that is, uh, that is going to help the financial institutions in controlling because Fed now has that visibility, right? In addition to that, um, there are consortiums coming up. Um, the private consortiums or the public open consortiums, they say, hey, let's start sharing this information. You know, if you see an event of fraud, share it with me. And I will, if somebody else is seeing a fraud for which you are also sending a transaction, I'm going to share it with you. So it's kind of a mutual benefit for all the financial institutions. And that is going to help in terms of, hey, you know, if one bank sees, uh, sees this account as a fraudulent, account, they flag it, and all other banks will get an alert. And if the, that such payment is going, then it can be stopped. So, you know, there are options because the good thing is, no matter what you do, fraudsters are going to find a way to do that one. We just need to be one step ahead of them, right? Um, you know, we cannot stop just because the fraudsters are there, you know, we should not stop doing what is right for our customers, what is right for, you know, for them, right? So frauds are going to happen. We need to be alert. We need to make sure we have the right tools and uh, systems and risk management in place to control such things. And another question from the audience, are there privacy security challenges for customers and their account information as compared to Venmo or Zelle where no account information is required? I think that's a great question. So today, FedNow, is an account to account transfer, right? So today, if you want to send a payment, I need to, you know, let's say I need to send money to you and you need to share your routing number, account number with me. You know, that's the way it is today, okay? That's but not FedNow, you're saying. You know, FedNow, you know, FedNow is account to account transfer. You know, any, any account to account transfer, like ACH, wires, FedNow, RTP, all these, all these systems, we need to have, the account information of okay. the receiving party to send the payment. But in case of Venmo and Zelle, you know, you just need to give that, you know, email address or phone number or some, you know, unique ID that, that you have created. But what is happening behind the scene is, you know, there is a lookup, hey, I want to send, uh, you know, a payment to Ms. Snyder at, you know, gmail.com. 
and uh, when you do that one it, it is registered with an account number and that is managed by Zelle or Venmo right so there is an account number behind it it's just not visible to me I think that's the best way to protect that information because no one wants to nobody should share account number and routing number so what is happening is Fed is already you know this one of the next major uh, plan for them and I don't want to speak for Fed but you know we are we, there is certain things that's happening where we can look for wait um, have a open directory you know the directory is going to allow us to register account number and routing number to an email address or some unique id and that we can use that one to you know look up hey you know i want to send payment to snyder at gmail.com that's what i will send it to the bank and then bank will do a look up hey there's this is this email address linked to any of the bank account you know it says yes here's the bank account and then I will further send through that bank to bank transfer. So it will be still account to account transfer, but I will be hiding that information with a private um, ID, like email address or some handle or some phone number. Okay. Um, question three we got from the audience. Could Switzerland deploy a universal ID verification system for customer onboarding? Wouldn't a similar U.S. system reduce fraud, especially with the Fed now risk? So can that, you please repeat the question again? Universal ID. Yeah, you, Switzerland deployed a universal ID verification system for customer mm -hmm. onboarding. Wouldn't mm -hmm. a similar U.S. system reduce fraud? And I think maybe that's what you were just addressing just now. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, that, I think that's a great question, right? Again, you know, let's say you have snyder at gmail.com registered with an account number and then how do i verify so there is an account verification can be done using the service right you know i can send you a request for you know i can send you a zero and it can uh, there is a validation that i can do that one. right right um, you know when you register your account number and name with this registration id i can use that one hey is this is the right account number so you can also validate name and account number through the api so this is this is a field that is evolving today there are services that does the account validation but that does not cover 100 percent of the accounts available in the united states um and it's come out maybe 65 75 percent of the accounts are covered through those services but with fed now we can expect and it's not happening today but in you know we can expect there will be players and we will be one of them that provides that kind of account validation service where okay. hey, you know here is this here is this information can you validate it's not, for us? It's not here today, but we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we are how only do, in the first, right? We have several steps to go. How do banks settle their clearing account with the Fed or upstream correspondent bank? Do they keep a larger amount of cash on deposit? Yeah, that's a, that's a, I think that's a, another great question. So there are two ways that you can manage settlement and clearing of the funds, right? So the way money moves is right. Let's say you are you are with bank A and I'm with bank B. I am sending money from my account to your account. So what happens is my bank has an account with Federal Reserve and your bank has an account with Federal Reserve. And when I send the money to you, my bank instructs Fed, hey, transfer $100 from you know, from my account to and send deliver to Miss Snyder at this bank A, right? Um, when when I you know when when that happens, the money actually moves from the Fed account of bank B to bank A, and then bank A said, "Hey, I go I have got my money, and and then they will deposit in your account, right?" So the question here is, hey, how do I manage? Do I have enough funds to manage this account? So remember, it's a 24 by 7, right? You need to have enough funds to cover the payments that you are going to send, you know, 24 by 7. So you need to con continuously monitor what, how much available funds you have in your Fed account and make sure, you know, that gets funded before the payments get initiated. If the bank is not equipped to have that funding, you know, hey, I don't want to manage it myself and I want to outsource it to someone who can manage that funding. They can go to some some other correspondent banks who can do that for them. Like, you know, they just don't have to manage 
enough funding and liquidity, what happens is the correspondent banks will give you a line of credit to the to this you know community banks or credit unions, and then the correspondent bank will deliver from its fund to the other receiving party. So you know there are two ways the banks can look for such funding options. One is direct settlement and clearing. Another one is through the correspondent bank. Right. This is another similar, very similar question, but it's about Finsley. Mm -hmm. how, how does a simple transfer between accounts fall in the Finsley payments hub? Can a bank store future dated and recurring scheduled internal transfers in the Finsley system? Yes, we do ben that one. So we have the, you know, you can go to our website and you can look at our API. Okay. Um, you know, in the API, you see all those requests coming in. Like you can send instant payment or you can schedule your payment with your date. Hey, I want to send this payment on this date. You can also set up recurring payments. Hey, I want to send this payment this many times, you know, with this frequency. Or you can set up the payments. Hey, I want to send this payment until I cancel. You can set up the payments, you know, for this many months or until the total amount is paid, you know, X dollars, right? You can, you can set up the recurring payments. And you can also set up recurring requests for payments because let's say hey, here is a subscription. It's $150 per month that, you know, that you need to pay me for the service. Let's say Netflix service or Amazon Prime or whatever that you want to say. I can automatically set up recurring payments through the service also. They set up automated recurring. Then our API will automatically initiate that request for pay or sending payments. Mm -hmm. How do you... And, you know, and the one more thing you asked was internal transfer. So, so what is, I think I need to explain what is an internal transfer. So internal transfer is, let's say, um, you know, you and I um, have an account with the same bank and I'm sending money from my account to your account. There is no need for this bank to send that request to Federal Reserve and then receive it back again from Federal Reserve because it's the same account. So once the system knows, hey, this customer belongs belongs to me and I can just do an internal transfer from my account to your account instead of going through you know, a longer route. So that's an internal transfer and we support that as well. Okay. I'm going to get to a question we got about liquidity in a moment um, related to these transfers, but do you, one other um, listener here on this webinar said, do you have any sense of how banks are going to price Fed now? Do you see these rates being capped at some point? Yeah, that's. I think that's a very interesting question. You know, um, I think it's going to be very different for different banks. Um, but what I would suggest is it's going to fall somewhere in between. You know, you have to, you know, you cannot charge as low as, you know, ACH. And you cannot, you know, and you cannot charge as high as wires because wires are meant for big, larger ones, right? And I see this falling somewhere in between. I think there was a recent study, um, and uh, not remember the source, but it was about you know ten and a half dollars or something like that that you can charge as a fee to process Fed now payments. It's, it's that ballpark, right? So you know anywhere from you know, and there are also fin you know, some players. They may say, hey, five dollars, I will do. Base it depends on the volume, you know, and, and depends on the who is the customer that you are charging, right? If I'm if I if I am going to initiate in you know, hundred thousand payments per day, you know, and you are charging me two dollars, it's two hundred thousand dollars per day of revenue for the bank, you know. So it's kind of volume will play into that role. But if it is a one-time payment, I'm initiating from my you know business banking account, you know, you charge them twenty-five dollars, they'll be fine because you know, um, you know, it's just like you can you can charge them as same as wire payment or you know, I think. It's, it's kind of where it's kind of I would say about five dollars to whatever you charge for the wire fee. I think that's the range I would okay. expect bank to be charging. Oh, okay. Because I could see the industry sort of undercutting itself here. You know, you know, offering services for less than they're getting otherwise through wires and so forth, and and yeah. and then having to try to make up for it with volume. I think you see. I think that's that's true, right? You know, one thing that we can expect is the volume will be much higher once we go to that model. Like you think about daily payments, payroll, right? You are getting payroll once in two weeks, right? 
Instead of that, with your daily payroll, you will start receiving 10 times in two weeks. That is 10 times more payments, more volume that the banks are going to handle. So the use cases will enable, hey, this is instant and it is, you know, and we can do that. So it is, they, they are not going to see all that kind of revenue from day one, but they will, once they start building the foundation and creating and building a strategy and creating a, creating the offering that allows the banks to start doing that one, that's when they will start seeing that revenue, like, you know, recurring payments, setting up templates, just setting up transfers, etc. Yeah. And this other question coming in from the audience, this is kind of an unfair question to ask somebody in software, but um, it's about the, <laughs> you know, the risks we've been seeing of bank runs, um, liquidity risk, and whether services like this are going to add to that risk. Um, yeah. People have an easy, easy access to getting their deposits and they're just, you know. See, when it's a, when it's a bank run, in, no matter what you do, it, is, it cannot be stopped, right? Why yes, you know, where I think this is already, you know, it can happen even without Fed now. And you have the wire platform and it is, it is instantaneous, right? So, you know, it is, there is no way that if somebody is, you know, if somebody wants to take the money out of the bank, you can, you know, you can stop because it is their money and they have the right to take, whether it is Fed now or wires, you know, wire exists today, right? Um, so I would just say the banks have to be ready to provide liquidity and just be in a good shape, right? Um, right. Because you cannot stop bank run if the bank is in really bad shape. Right. <laughs> and for um, for fraud controls, would something like Google Authenticator um, need to be incorporated as part of the request flow to verify identity before processing a transfer? And Google Authenticator is that app right on your phone that you can use to verify. Um, That's something. right. Yeah. So, you know, Google Authenticator makes sense. Uh, you know, we, we support Google Authenticator for our customers and our bank's customers because when they go online, you know, before they log in, they have to verify, hey, tell me you are who you are, right? They can verify that one. And sometimes you can also, we also verify that one for payments, for some large payments, say hey, you just do this, you know, if you have this one, re-enter your Google Authenticator and numbers, right? And that is, you know, you can, basically it's a fraud prevention, right? Um, so when it is initiated through the channels that supports Google Authenticator, yes, you can, you know, you can enable Google Authentication as, as a way to authenticate the user and you can do that one. But let's say the fraud is happening because, you know, you clicked a link, and that person is a wrong person and you are still going through you yourself initiating the payment and you are approving it. And then later you are finding out that's a fraud, you know, you cannot control it. So, you know, there are different tools for different, different use cases. So Google Authenticator is one of the tools that can be deployed for certain use cases. And there are other tools available for different type of fraud scenario. Okay, okay. Um, so one question that I had just before we wrap up here is, is, you know, the question of fintech partners who might be interested in testing APIs. How do they go about that? Yeah. So, you know, I think the, as I said, like the fintechs are going to play a major role in offering this Fed now through their platforms, because you can see the future is all interconnected banking, you know, systems connected to the banks through the API. So that you know, when the insurance company approves that payment, payment is delivered to the to the insured, right? Likewise, when the restaurant makes that tips and you know, enters the time entry and number of hours they work and tips they have earned, they submit that one. That system is going to talk to the bank and say, "Hey, make these payments to these parties," right? So, which means you have you have you have created an interconnected interconnected banking system, right? Um, today, all these things are happening through files. You know, the the businesses they upload a file, and then they they later they know that hey, ten of the payments failed. But the feature in the feature, it's all about you know making an API call, and instantly you will know that payment went through or not, right? So that's the that's the power of the API. And you know anybody can go to Finsley website, and we have a site that gives complete details of how you can access the payment network. It's not only FedNow, you can access ACH, wires, RTP, FedNow, or international. 
all through a single API. So one API supports everything. So you just have to tell, you know, speed is economy, economy plus, express or real time. So based on that, the system automatically routes payment through one of the network and you can send payment, you can request payment and you know, it's all universal um, API, right? So, you know, once you can, you can develop, you can test um, with sample request and get a response back. And as soon as you are ready, then, you know, what we do is we connect you with one of the sponsor bank and uh, hey, you know, now the, the payment is seamless. So, you know, you connect to Finsley through the API and you are ready to go, you know, we, we go with the partner bank that, that sponsors your transactions. You know, basically that's where you have your account and that's where you will send and receive payments from. So it's very simple and uh, we make it so easy so anybody can go and test. You just need four lines of code and you are connected to Fred now because we, you know, our technology has enabled that one. So four or okay. five lines of code within a day, you can, you know, any FinTech can access Fred now, but, you know, we need to, um, you know, obviously there are so many players who come and ask, act, act, want to access Fed now. There is a risk framework, risk management that in our banks do because they want to, they want to prevent risk at the time of the onboarding such fintechs, right? They will understand what right. are, what they're doing and all this stuff. And then finally they say they, you know, if, if it meets the risk profile, um, the fintech gets onboarded and then they can start making those transactions. Yeah, good. Yeah, well, fascinating topic. We get a lot of uh, questions from the audience today. And uh, to the audience, as a reminder, we are gonna receive a recorded version of this webinar within 24 hours. And we will also post this on bankdirector.com. So thanks so much to Bushan and Finsley for co-hosting today's webinar. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Naomi. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for everyone joining.